Chapter Seventeen of God's Country and the Woman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. God's Country and the Woman by James Oliver Curwood. Chapter Seventeen. Scarcely had Jean uttered the few words that preceded his lapse into unconsciousness than Philip heard the laughing voice of Adair at the further end of the hall. Heavy footsteps followed the voice. Impulse rather than reason urged him into action. He lowered Jean to the floor, sprang to the partly open door, closed it, and softly locked it. He was not a moment too soon. A few steps more, and Adair was beating on the panel with his fist. "'What ho!' he cried in his booming voice. "'Josephine wants to know if you have forgotten her.' Adair's hand was on the latch. "'I am undressed,' explained Philip desperately. "'Offer a thousand apologies for me, mon père. "'I will finish my bath in a hurry.' "'He dropped on his knees beside Jean "'as the master of Adair moved away from the door. "'A brief examination showed him where Croisette was hurt. "'The half-breed had received a scalp wound "'from which the blood had flowed down over his face and breast. "'He breathed easier when he discovered nothing beyond this. "'In a few minutes he had him partially stripped and on his bed.' jean opened his eyes as he bathed the blood from his face he made an effort to rise but philip held him back not yet jean he said jean's glance shifted in a look of alarm toward the door i must monsieur he insisted it was the last few hundred yards that made me dizzy i am better now and there is no time to lose i must get into my room into other clothes we will not be interrupted philip assured him is this your only hurt jean that alone, monsieur. It was not bad until an hour ago. Then it broke out afresh, and made me so dizzy that with my last breath I stumbled into your room. The saints be praised that I managed to reach you. Philip left him to return in a moment with a flask. Jean had pulled himself into a sitting posture on the side of the bed. Here is a drop of whisky, Jean. It will stir up your blood. Mon Dieu, it has been stirred up enough this night, Taniki smiled jean feebly but it may give me voice monsieur will you get me fresh clothes they are in my room which is next to this on the right i must be prepared for josephine or le monsieur before i talk philip went to the door and opened it cautiously he could hear voices coming from the room through which he had first entered adair house the hall was clear he slipped out and moved swiftly to jean's room Five minutes later he re-entered his own room with an armful of Jean's clothes. Already Croisette was something like himself. He quickly put on the garments Philip gave him, brushed the tangles from his hair, and called upon Philip to examine him to make sure he had left no spot of blood on his face or neck. "'You have the time?' he asked then. Philip looked at his watch. "'It is eight o'clock.' "'And I must see Josephine alone before ten said jean quickly you must arrange it monsieur no one must know that i have returned until i see her it is important it means what the great god alone can answer that replied jean in a strange voice perhaps it will mean that to-morrow or the next day or the day after that monsieur wayman will know the secret we are keeping from him now and will fight shoulder to shoulder with jean jacques croisette in a fight that the wilderness will remember so long as there are tongues to tell of it there was nothing of boastfulness or of excitement in his words. They were in the voice of a man who saw himself facing the final arbiter of things, a voice dead to visible hope, yet behind which there trembled a thing that made Philip face him with a new fire in his eyes. "'Why to-morrow, or the next day?' he demanded. "'Why shroud me in this damnable mystery any longer, Jean? If there is fighting to be done, let me fight!' Jean's hollowed cheeks took on a flush. I would give my life if we two could go out and fight, as I want to fight, he said in a low, tense voice. It would be worth your life and mine, that fight. It would be glorious. But I am a Catholic, monsieur. I am a Catholic of the wilderness, and I have taken the most binding oath in the world. I have sworn by the sweet soul of my dead Iowaka to do only as Josephine tells me to do in this. Over her grave I swore that, with Josephine kneeling at my side. I have prayed that my Iowaka might come to me and tell me if I am right. But in this her voice has been silent. I have prayed for Josephine to free me from my oath, and she has refused. 
I am afraid. I dare reveal nothing. I cannot act as I want to act. But to-night... His voice sank to a whisper. His fingers gripped deep into the flesh of Philip's hand. "'Tonight may mean something,' he went on, his voice filled with an excitement strange to him. "'The fight is coming, monsieur. We cannot much longer evade what we have been trying to evade. It is coming, and then, shoulder to shoulder, we will fight. And until then, must I wait?' "'Yes, you must wait, monsieur.' Jean freed his hand and sat down in one of the chairs near the table. His eyes turned toward the window. "'You need not fear another shot, monsieur,' he said quietly. "'The man who fired that will not fire again.' "'You killed him?' Jean bowed his head without replying. The movement was neither of affirmation nor denial. "'He will not fire again.' "'It was more than one against one,' persisted Philip. "'Does your oath compel you to keep silent about that, too?' There was a note of irritation in his voice, which was almost a challenge to Jean. It did not prick the half-breed. He looked at Philip a moment before he replied. "'You are an unusual man, monsieur,' he said at last, as though he had been carefully measuring his words. "'We have known each other only a few days, and yet it seems a long time. I had my suspicions of you back there. I thought it was Josephine's beauty you were after, and I have stood ready to kill you if I saw in you what I feared.' "'But you have won, monsieur. Josephine loves you. I have faith in you. And do you know why? It is because you have fought the fight of a strong man. It does not take a great soul in a man to match knife against knife or bullet against bullet. Not to keep one's word. To play a hopeless part in the dark. To leap when the Numa Wapi is over the eyes and you are blind. That takes a man.' And now, when Jean-Jacques Croisset says for the first time that there is a ray of hope for you, where, a few hours ago, no hope existed, will you give me again your promise to play the part you have been asked to play? Hope? Philip was at Jean's side in an instant. Jean, what do you mean? Is it that you, even you, now give me hope of possessing Josephine? Slowly Jean rose from his chair. I am part Cree, monsieur he said, and in our creed there is a saying that the God of all things, Kisaminito, the great spirit, often sits on high and laughs at the tricks which he plays on men. Perhaps this is one of those times. I am beginning to believe so. Kisaminito has begun to run our destinies, not ourselves. Yesterday we, our Josephine and I, had hopes, our plans, our schemes well laid. Tonight they no longer exist. Before the night is much older, all that Josephine has done, all that she has made you promise, will count for nothing. After that, a matter of hours, perhaps of days, will come the fight for you and me. Until then you must know nothing, must see nothing, must ask nothing. And when the crash comes— "'It will give Josephine to me?' Philip cried eagerly. "'I did not say that, monsieur,' corrected Jean quietly. Out of fighting such as this, strange things may happen, and where things happen, there is always hope. Is that not true? He moved to the door and listened. Quietly he opened it and looked out. The hall is clear, he whispered softly. Go to Josephine. Tell her that she must arrange to see me within an hour, and if you care for that bit of hope I have shown you, let it happen without the knowledge of the master of Adair. From this hour, Jean-Jacques Croisset sacrifices his soul. Make haste, monsieur, and use caution. Without a word, Philip went quietly into the hall. Behind him, Jean closed and locked the door. End of chapter 17